first of all, I would like to open up this panel uh, by inviting Professor Brands to the podium to give his opening remarks. The floor is yours. Well, thank you for the introduction, and thanks very much uh, to, to Kate and her team for putting on this, this wonderful conference, and thanks to everybody for, for spending some time uh, with us here. So uh, the subject uh, of my talk uh, is the end of the post-Cold War era and the crisis of global order. And so as, as that indicates, uh, the focus of my talk is going to be more about diagnosis than prescription. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, what I see is the nature of the international system today uh, and the set of factors, the set of underlying factors, the tectonic trends uh, that frequently make the world seem so unsettled uh, and that actually are driving many of the crises that are capturing our attention uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and, and the geopolitical changes that are at work today are often framed in terms of polarity, uh, the debate on whether America's unipolar moment is over, uh, and a multipolar world has emerged. Uh, but I think this is actually a misleading way uh, of looking at the world. Because on the one hand, uh, discussions of polarity frequently exaggerate uh, American decline, because uh, there, there won't be a true peer, a true geopolitical peer to the United States for, for many years to come. Uh, but on the other hand, the polarity debate actually obscures both the degree and the breadth uh, of the ongoing changes in the international system, of the challenges facing uh, American officials today. Uh, and so the, the fundamental fact uh, of international politics today is that the post-Cold War era has come to an end. Uh, the defining features of that period were uh, essentially uncontested U.S. and Western geopolitical primacy, uh, marked declines in ideological struggle and great power conflict, uh, and a relatively high level of global cooperation in addressing key international security challenges. Uh, but now the world has returned to a more normal state, which is to say a more unsettled and a more dangerous state. Uh, and so what I'm going to do here for the next 15 minutes uh, is just to first outline what made the post-Cold War era so exceptional, uh, and then I'll talk about uh, the five dominant factors of international politics today. Uh, and the best way to understand our current era is to compare it to the previous one. Uh, and I would argue that the post-Cold War period was defined uh, by four key uh, geopolitical phenomena. Uh, and the first of these was essentially uncontested U.S. and Western primacy. So the United States emerged from the Cold War uh, with clear economic dominance. It had about 25 percent of global uh, GDP in 1994. Uh, it controlled about 40 percent of world defense outlays for most of the 1990s uh, and had just utterly unrivaled advantages in the key global power projection capabilities that allowed the United States to, to send its, its military might into all of the key strategic regions uh, around the globe. Uh, and this wasn't just unilateral dominance, because uh, if you go back to 1994, America's treaty allies uh, in Europe and the Asia Pacific accounted for another 47% of global GDP and 35% of global defense spending, which meant that the United States and its closest friends together possessed upward of 70% of global economic power and global military spending. And so th this was no balance of power. This was one of the most pronounced imbalances the world had ever seen. Uh, and this same dominance was evident in a second phenomenon, which was the decline of international ideological competition. Uh, so Francis Fukuyama's thesis about the end of history has been much critiqued, but I think it did capture three essential facts of the post-Cold War era. Uh, first, the fact that democracy and markets were spreading more widely than ever before. Uh, second, that there was no credible global competitor to the liberal capitalist model. Uh, and third, that even former U.S. enemies such as Russia and authoritarian states such as China we're making really unprecedented efforts to integrate into the liberal international order, uh, either economically, politically, or, or both. And so uh, the bottom line was that the intense ideological struggles of the 20th century seemed clearly to be over, uh, and the liberal model seemed incontestably ascendant. Uh, and these first two factors related to a third factor, which was the remarkable great power comity of the post-Cold War era. Uh, so the end of the Cold War did not uh, see a fragmenting of America's alliances, uh, didn't see a resurgence of Japanese or German revisionism, which was sometimes feared at the time. Uh, those countries remained closely tied to the United States. Uh, and at the same time, the sheer geopolitical dominance of the Western coalition meant that it was dangerous, if not impossible, uh, even for countries who, who didn't necessarily like the post-Cold War, uh, so Russia and China, to mount serious great power challenges uh, of their own, even when they strongly disagreed with U.S. policy. Uh, and so as a result of all this, the danger of great power war was historically low during the 1990s, uh, and great power rivalries were more muted than at any time since 
uh, the early period of the concert of Europe. Uh, and these characteristics related to a final post-Cold War phenomenon, which was a really remarkable multilateral cooperation in addressing the relatively mild forms of international disorder that prevailed after the Cold War. So the relative absence of great power conflict or serious ideological competition made it far easier to organize broad international coalitions to confront dangerous actors, whether that was Saddam Hussein in 1990, uh, Slobodan Milosevic in 1995, or Al-Qaeda after 9-11. Uh, and so by any meaningful historical comparison, just the basic structure of international politics was uniquely conducive to, to U.S. interests after the Cold War. Uh, but that is now changing as the international system shifts uh, in five key ways. Uh, and the first key structural shift underway today is the erosion of U.S. and Western primacy. Uh, I can go into greater detail on this in the discussion if people are interested, but, but I think it's incorrect to see this change as a transition from unipolarity to multipolarity. Uh, the United States still has some very significant economic advantages over China. Uh, it still has enormous advantages uh, in military terms and particularly in power projection terms. What has happened over the past 15 years is that the extent of U.S. and Western primacy has diminished. Uh, so the, the U.S. share of global wealth and military spending, uh, they've declined from about 25% and 42% in 2004 to 22% and 34% in 2015. The drop-off among America's allies has actually been far more severe. So U.S. allies in Europe and the Asia-Pacific uh, accounted for 47% of global GDP and 35% of global military spending in 1994. Those numbers had fallen to 39% and 25% uh, as of 2015. Uh, and many of America's allies, particularly in Europe, uh, have, have severely uh, uh, eroded their own military capabilities during this period. Uh, and all of this was happening, of course, uh, as Russia was undertaking a uh, significant military modernization program as China was seeing spectacular growth in both economic and, and military power. And so if you put all this together, uh, the basically uncontested U.S. primacy of the 1990s has become the more highly contested primacy of today. Uh, and this relates to a second shift, uh, which is the return of great power competition. Uh, what we're seeing today is, is that uh, authoritarian countries that were never fully reconciled to the post-Cold War order uh, and that accepted it only to the degree, degree that they were basically compelled to do so by U.S. primacy, uh, are now using their greater relative power to push back against that order uh, in key geopolitical regions from East Asia to the Middle East uh, to Eastern Europe. Uh, so if you look at East Asia, China is using a range of military, economic, diplomatic, uh, and informational tools to shift the balance of power and influence in the Western Pacific. Uh, island building, economic coercion, inducement, uh, the ongoing military buildup, all these things are meant to weaken U.S. influence in that region and establish China uh, as the region's foremost power. Uh, on the other side of Eurasia, Russia is reasserting its lost influence. It's seeking to undo key aspects of the post-Cold War settlement in Europe. Uh, it's also projecting uh, its power far, farther afield into areas like uh, the Levant. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, Iran is not nearly in the same power political class as Russia or China, but it is still uh, an ambitious regional power that, that's trying to increase its influence via the use of proxy forces, uh, the, the spreading of sectarianism, uh, and investments in asymmetric military capabilities. Uh, and each of these geopolitical uh, challenges is very different, but, but taken collectively, they really amount to a geopolitical sea change from the early post-Cold War, era, because they show that each of the key regional orders that have supported the broader international order are now being challenged, uh, and they show that the great power competition has returned with all of the dangers and tensions uh, that it brings. Uh, and this relates to a third key characteristic of the international environment today, which is that global ideological struggle uh, has returned. The spread of democracy ha has clearly stalled. The number of electoral democracies in the world has basically stagnated since 2005. Uh, and if you measure democracy on a continuum rather than as a binary variable, in, in every year since 2006, more countries have experienced declines in freedom than, than increases. Uh, authoritarian models are increasingly making a comeback, not just in places like Venezuela and the Philippines, uh, but, but even in Europe, and we've seen some striking authoritarian sentiments in the United States uh, in the past few years. Uh, and not least, the world's most powerful authoritarian states are increasingly uh, working not just to repress internal challenges, but, but to halt and, and even reverse democracy's advances overseas. And so Russia and China, for instance, are supporting authoritarian regimes uh, in their own geopolitical neighborhoods. They're resisting efforts to punish gross human rights violations in the United Nations. Uh, and in recent years, in fact, all three uh, of America's key geopolitical competitors, Russia, China, and Iran, uh, have lent various forms of support to Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria uh, to prevent it uh, 
uh, from being overthrown by what they see as a Western-backed uh, insurgency. And so uh, the end of history has clearly ended. The global ideological competition uh, has returned. Uh, and this brings me to a, a fourth uh, marker of the involving international system, uh, which is, uh, I think, just best described in very general terms as an intensification of global disorder. Uh, so Headley Bull, uh, in his, his great book, the, the Anarchical Society, wrote that international politics features a continual clash between the forces of order and the forces of disorder. Uh, and today, as a result of factors uh, ranging from rapid technological change to the disruptions caused by globalization, the, the forces of disorder seem more empowered than at any time uh, in decades. Uh, and you can see this in a variety of, of trends that might otherwise seem unrelated. You can see it in, in the rise uh, of countries that might, uh, actors that might be termed super spoilers. So, so these are actors like North Korea or the Islamic State, uh, actors that cannot remake the international order, but they can disrupt it in fundamental ways. Uh, you can see it uh, in the way that contemporary instability uh, is now manifesting itself uh, on a scale not seen for decades in, in regions like the Middle East. Uh, and you can see it in the proliferation of issues that are just increasingly difficult to address through existing uh, international forums, so cyber warfare, for instance. Uh, and then to add to this, uh, if it was hard enough for the international community to address this type of disorder before, it, it's much harder now amid renewed great power competition. Uh, and so the, the, the example I like to give here is the contrast between Bosnia in the mid-1990s and Syria over the past several years. So uh, it took the international community forever to get around uh, to getting to a point of resolving the, the conflict in Bosnia in the mid-1990s, but the combination of uh, U.S. and Western preeminence uh, and relatively friendly relations with Russia did eventually make possible a multilateral intervention to end that conflict. Uh, over the past several years, by contrast, we've seen that the geopolitical conflict between the United States and, and Russia, and the United States and its allies in Russia, uh, has repeatedly frustrated uh, efforts to bring the Syrian civil war to a close. Uh, and in the same vein, uh, any effort to develop international norms regarding cyberspace uh, is likely to face challenges because both Russia and China are aggressively utilizing hacking, cyber espionage, and other tools uh, as a means of competition uh, with their adversaries. Uh, and so the contested nature of global politics is compounded by the fact that the sources of today's upheaval often interact with and exacerbate one another. Uh, and all of that upheaval, in turn, is magnified by the fifth characteristic uh, of contemporary global politics, which is uh, increasing uncertainty about the willpower of the chief defenders of, of the post-Cold War or post-World War II system. So uh, the European allies, for instance, have, have long represented America's most crucial partners in upholding international stability. Uh, but, but I think, at the very least, we can say that Europe is now experiencing uh, a fairly profound internal crisis at the same time as its capacity to act as a stabilizing influence in a more turbulent world uh, has also receded fairly significantly uh, over the past two decades. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, U.S. leadership is, is facing its greatest crisis in, in decades. Uh, and I think it's important to point out that that crisis didn't start with, with Donald Trump. It has deeper origins than I think many observers realize, that there was always likely to be uh, a certain ennui with American globalism after the Cold War, just because the threat that had initially catalyzed that globalism, the Soviet Union, had vanished. Uh, and, th and this ennui temporarily vanished after 9-11, uh, but it returned with, with a vengeance after two frustrating wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so by 2013, 52% uh, of Americans thought that the country should mind its own business internationally and let other countries get along the best they can on their own. Uh, that number had risen to 57% uh, by 2016. Uh, and more recently, of course, this crisis of American leadership has been manifested in the election of, of Donald Trump. Uh, just to put it very briefly, this is a president who appears to think that US leadership, the international system, uh, is not a good deal for the United States. It, it's a sucker bet that has allowed other nations, both friends and foes, to enrich themselves at America's expense. Uh, and indeed, I think what, what Trump's ideas and his rhetoric uh, represent are not really a return to isolationism as we uh, traditionally understand it, but simply uh, a rejection of the idea that Washington should bear the primary burdens uh, of global stability and prosperity because doing so serves America's interests uh, as well. Now, uh, I want to add that we've heard lots of predictions uh, of American decline and retreat in the past, of course, and, and so far those predictions have generally been proven wrong in the long run. Uh, but I think what, what's clear, though, uh, is that there is now uh, quite deep uncertainty about the, the, the medium and long-term future of U.S. policy. Uh, and that uncertainty, if it continues for a long enough period, can itself be destabilizing. It, it could eventually promote hedging by U.S. allies. It could provoke sharper challenges 
uh, from adversaries who, who see that the, the restraining forces arrayed against them are no longer so strong. It could hasten the decay uh, of liberal institutions like the EU or intensify pressures on the global trading system. Uh, and just more broadly, if the United States uh, starts to act erratically on a consistent basis in global affairs, and there are already some signs of this, then the perception of U.S. steadiness and commitment that has underpinned the international order could itself be, be eroded. Uh, and, and not all of this is going to happen overnight, certainly. It would take a period of, of many years. But we can already see, in some cases, the early signs of this happening. Uh, and so my bottom line here is that a, a period of growing uh, international turmoil is probably a bad time to stoke uncertainty about America's traditionally uh, stabilizing global role, but that is precisely what is happening today. And it's the combination of these things uh, that could be particularly pernicious. Uh, now, I don't want to end on a note of, of doom and gloom. Uh, and so I'll just say that I, I think it's important to keep in mind that, that not all is lost. So uh, American power and leadership have, have proven to be very resilient in the past. Uh, and the countries that still support the liberal or national order uh, still control a preponderance of global power. The United States and its treaty allies still account for about 60% of global GDP and military spending. Uh, and that's not even including countries like, like India or Vietnam or the UAE, who, who generally act in concert, uh, if only in an informal sense, uh, with, with the United States and some of its partners. Uh, the countries that are challenging the international order, Russia, China, Iran, and others, they're strong in some ways, but have profound weaknesses uh, in other ways. And so, so my general sense is that if the supporters of the existing international system, uh, they can make a credible defense uh, of that system if they get their act together, if they can summon the purpose and the will and the cohesion to do so. And, and so I would say that the major question we face today is whether they will be able to do that. Thank you. <laughs>